Welcome back to Cards and Comics. And today I have another episode of Hobby Talk where I am going to talk about something to do with the hobby. And it's good to be back. I have not done one of these in a little bit. Uh, just, you know, work has been keeping me on my toes. Um, you know, just a lot of stuff going on. Holidays and just, you know, general having family and all that stuff. So, you know, I can't do daily content. I just don't have the time. Um, and even sometimes it's hard for me to do, you know, two or three videos a week. Sorry about that. However, I will say, um, I am planning on having a live uh, probably this Thursday or Friday. I like to do Thursday if I can, um, just because um, I know a lot of other creators do Fridays and Saturdays. And so, um, you know, maybe I'll take over um, a Thursday slot. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. But look for a, a little post on my channel like I normally do. Uh, we'll do another live giveaway. And I know um, I'm sending out Rocco's uh, prize, the last winner. Just sent it out a little late. I know. I'm sorry. But again, it's been a little bit of a hectic time. And uh, so, yeah. So we'll get on the topic today. And uh, it's pretty simple, you know. And uh, it's the idea that, you know, I want to convey that, you know, if you've been in the hobby a long time. And again, I started in 1986. I seriously started collecting, you know, right after college. So, you know, around 97. You know, from 86 to, to like 93, you know, I collected mostly with my dad. And, uh, you know, we put together some pretty nice cards. But once I got out of college, you know, and got a job and actually had, you know, my own money for the most part, I really got more interested in collecting. But the idea that, you know, just because I've been in the game a long time, that I'm somehow really smart at investing or, you know, turning, uh, you know, or, you know, being smart about what I buy, um, it's just not the case. Um, now, I'm not saying that I haven't made good purchases or haven't accumulated good cards over the years because I, I, I definitely have. But if I look at opportunities that I missed out on, um, trades that I made, cards that I bought, cards that I sold uh, to purchase other cards, I would say that in general I'm down you know, from potential to what I actually did, um, not great. And so, you know, I titled the video, you know, I suck at investing in cards because I do, because I'm a collector and I don't have the mentality at all times to just, you know, look for the value. And the reason why I want to <clears throat> talk about a few of the examples is just to give people the reality that um, unless you're just a ruthless um, investor who has no connection to the cards, to the hobby, to the people you're collecting, to the sport, to the teams or whatever, you're going to have biases that prevent you from making the best decisions. And that's why when I look at a lot of these investment channels or people who claim to, you know, that they're you know, investors, like a good example is Jeff, right? You know, Jeff Wilson, he definitely has biases on years and cards and sets and players. And it, you know, clouds his way of, of uh, buying. And so he's not maximizing, you know, his, uh, you know, ability to create a, you know, uh, amazing collection or, you know, investment collection or investment cards. Right. And that's what happens. You know, that's the, perfect example of, of a collector mentality that gets in the way of actually, you know, just purely investing. And so I just want to go through a few examples. I want to go through some of the mentality of, of why I made decisions that were very bad, very bad decisions, why I made those decisions and, you know, trying to like have some self forgiveness. So starting out here that, you know, the idea that you're going to make bad decisions because you're a collector, um, but the first thing, first I'm going to go through is not because I was a collector um, so much is I wanted to have cool cards. And so the first one I'm going to talk about here is I wanted to have the hottest player at the time and a card that I thought was rare and cool. But I just wanted to go to card shows, you know, I was set up as a dealer and have something no one else had. 
And so the first card I'm going to talk about here is this 2010 Alan Ginter Steven Strasberg mini card. And I'm showing you just what it looks like. This is a recent sale. So a PSA 8 or sorry, BGS 8 sold for around 60 bucks. Uh, so I think at a 9 or 10, you know, it would sell pretty high. But this card was, so, you know, let's give you some history here. The card itself was a short print that was inserted at the last minute in Allen and Ginter when Steven Strasberg just went through, you know, through the roof. And um, for people who think uh, Mike Trout started, you know, this sort of like renaissance and, and baseball rookies, it was actually Steven Strasberg. Steven Strasberg was the first big rookie in the in the 2000, uh, you know, late 2000s, uh, early you know, 2010 era that kick started the retail, the hobby. Again, you know, people were searching for Bowman uh, products to pull his rookie card. His his base rookie card was worth, you know, I think twenty five or fifty bucks for the Bowman and like a hundred bucks for the Bowman Chrome. Um, the autos were through the roof. Um, someone paid an ungodly amount for, you know, the the Super Fractor, I believe. I mean, there was just like on and on about how valuable his cards were. Um, you know, at the time. And, you know, and he's still a great player. I mean, you know, he gets hurt, but, you know, his stats are amazing. So when if he could have stayed healthy, he would have been an all-time great. I think he may even still make the Hall of Fame even with uh, the injuries he's had. So he still had a great career, but injuries, you know, made him go from being an all-time great to just a really, really good player, possible Hall of Famer. But this card here, this super short print Ginter, the reason why it was important at the time was that he really had no... Um, you know, really short printed rookie cards because he just had like base cards, some autographs, but basically this card was like, you know, just came out uh, at the time that I bought it. Um, I'll give you the story around buying it and what I paid. Um, but it was at a Chicago sports fest that when I went and got this card, it just came out and it was blazing. It was like super high. You couldn't find it. It was unannounced. It was basically no one knew this card was actually in the set. It was super rare. People were just going nuts on it. And this card was selling for a lot of money um, because, again, Strasburg was the big rookie. And so people thought maybe this card was like a you know super, super short print. And it is. It's a short print. You can tell because there's like two cells. But the idea, though, is that um, they also uh, miscut every one of these cards. So they're all basically cut uh you know to the left and to the to the top and so none of these cards will grade a 10 they're all miscut and so that's another thing that happened they they got this into production so fast they basically miscut all the cards i've never seen this card centered so again you know like it's just but it's a it was a card that was a ghost and so when i went to the sports fest in chicago in 2010 you know this card was selling for about a thousand dollars and so I was at the show, I had sold a lot of cards, and I had the money, and so I really wanted a Steven Strasburg card. And there was people there with, you know, autographs and Bowman Chrome cards, and then I saw this card. Now, at the same time, as I was walking around, another dealer offered me a PSA 9 Michael Jordan. And so what I have here is the pricing of a PSA 9 Michael Jordan. Now, today's average value is $15,000. But in 2010, around the time period that I was at this card show, the card was fluctuating from $1,100 up to 12 to 15. But $1,100 is about what the card was selling for consistently. You can see just $1,100 on the nose quite often. Okay, so $1,100. So the dealer that offered me this Michael Jordan card, PSA 9, said i will take 800 dollars for it and i said no i'm going to buy the steven strasberg card for a thousand dollars and i made that decision and it was horrible horrible decision it's it's you know like haunts me to this day that i could have had a psa 9 jordan rookie card for 800 dollars way under value the dealer was having a bad day he needed something to sell and he had multiple copies of that Jordan card. And I was like, you know, but I had the opinion that, well, that card isn't rare. The Strasburg card's rare. He's the hottest player. It's the coolest card of his that's out right now. Everyone's looking for it. 
And that's how I made my decision. So it was an emotional, irrational decision. And, but it made sense at that one moment in time. But literally a year later, you know, I instantly regretted it. You know, <laughs> a year later, instant regret. Um, so yeah, so that's just, you know, the first thing. And so what I want to just say is like, you know, people make these kind of decisions all the time around new cards. So, and this is, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to turn this into a, a bashing of vintage versus modern. But what I'm saying is that, you know, we make decisions because we want cards that are hot or popular because we want those cards to make us popular. We want to go to the card show and, and open up your case and open up your display and, and have the coolest cards at the show. We want people to be like, wow, your cards are cool. You're, you have like the hottest cards. I can't believe you have that card. I've never seen that card. And in general, um, they say that about modern cards. That, you know, it's going to get people's attention. You're going to get people like, you know, be really, you know, like, hey, this guy's got something super rare and cool. And I've never seen that card before. And that's sort of what you want. That There is this ego part of being in the hobby. You You want people to think your stuff is cool. And so that's why I made that decision. I wanted a cool card. I wanted people to stop at my table and say, I can't believe you have that card. That card's so cool. Um, but, you know, that, you know, decision was, the, from an investment perspective, one of the worst decisions I've ever made. The next one I'm going to talk about is for, you know, another reason. So the other example I want to give about, you know, like what I was thinking when I was making these really bad decisions here. Um, when I talk about you know, investment decisions. If I was just purely an investor, I would have never made this decision. So here I've got a 57 Hank Aaron. And so this is around the time period I made this decision, which is around 2005, 2000, sorry, 2008. Around 2008 is when I made this decision. So I was at a card show in Cincinnati and I'm a big Pirates fan, right? So I'm walking around the show and someone has this card right here it is the and i'm sorry i don't have a photo of it but it's the 2005 tops chrome update x refractor auto of andrew mccutcheon and it's number to 25 and you know i I'll, um hopefully i get a photo of it to put in the um, video but it's a really nice looking card it was really cool i've never seen one and i was at the time trying to be a super collector of pirate modern cards. So I was, you know, buying the Stetson Ali cards and the Taeon cards and, and, you know, Garrett Cole cards and, and, you know, all the pirate rookies. And, but the Alpha and Omega was Andrew McCutcheon. So I had all of his Bowman Chrome autos. I had all of his Topps Chrome autos. I had super fractors and I mean, just on and on. I, you know, I've got, you know, bat knobs and logo mans. And I mean, just, I had every, you know, uh, super fractors of, of McCutcheon. So I had this giant McCutcheon collection, but I didn't have this card. This is his rookie card. It's like the card. So I had to have it. And so and you look at, you know, what it sold for today. This card recently sold in 2020 in a PSA or sorry, BVG 9.5. That's the last sale that I have, you know, or BGS 9.5. Um, and it sold for, you know, 500 bucks two years ago, um, or sorry, $450. And so if you take that and you extrapolate what it was probably worth in 2008, you know, this card was, you know, legitimately around a thousand dollar card. And so the only card I had that people wanted to, to that I had people that were people wanting to sell, uh, that they were willing to to, to buy from me at the time was a 57 Hank Aaron. And this card was bringing between four, you know, say $550 and 700. So, you know, um, well, let's say, you know, it's, it's, it's a solid $600 card, you know, um, back in 2008, you know, um, you know, again, it can vary a little bit. So maybe 650, but you know, between, you know, six and $700, this card for the most part, um, you know, and that's the only card that someone wanted. And so I sold my 57 Aaron PSA eight and bought the Andrew McCutcheon, you know, um, I probably sold some other cards. So I remember the 57 Aaron was the big card I got rid of to be able to afford the McCutcheon. And, uh, 
you know, if you look at the car now, the, the, you know, that's the price of the 57 Aaron. It's gone up to $4,000 and the McCutcheon has gone down to $400. Um, so one of the cards went up, you know, eight X and the other card went down 10 X, um, or, you know, sorry, went down by 50% or more. So bad decision, but you know, again, you know, I was trying to be a McCutcheon super collector. That was his coolest card. Um, and I just had to have it, you know, because it just, you know, it's the card that I was meant to own. And the only way I could get it was selling a 57 Aaron PSA eight. And I made that decision. So from an investment perspective, terrible, again, terrible decision. And so these are the only, you know, two things I want, you know, I, I can give examples on, I can go through and probably give you five or 10 more off the top of my head, but I just wanted to, to highlight these two because I did it for a reason because I'm a collector. And so that part of my brain is going to make my investment part of my brain malfunction. You know, I'm going to have an error in the system that I'm not going to make good choices. So if, if you're trying to be both an investor and a collector, um, just know that, that you're going to make um, irrational choices and decisions. You're going to think with your heart sometimes, not with your head. And to me, it's okay if, if you get up something that you love. And I still have this McCutcheon card. So I, I <laughs> and I've replaced the Aaron card, uh, luckily. Now, um, I've never gotten an 86 Fleer Michael Jordan PSA 9. That was my one chance to probably get that card at a price point that people today would think is ridiculous but you know that's what it was worth back in the day but i got it I, it was even a bigger discount than you know um what it was selling for at the time which is sort of unheard of to to get a you know jordan rookie you know at 80 percent of comp you know which was what he was offering so you know i just wanted to say you know from a moral of the story is that you know besides that there's a glitch in the system if you're doing both collecting and investing that you have to also give yourself, you know, uh, a little bit of a break. There is no um, right and wrong way to collect, but there's also, you know, if, if you're just doing this from an investment perspective, then to me, you know, having vaults and never seeing the cards, never touching the cards, seeing them as just a stock portfolio, you know, chips, you know, or, or, or pieces of data, then, then that's a better way of doing it. Because once you get some sort of attachment to the cardboard, to the photos, to the stories, to the players, to the teams, it, it starts clouding your ability to make those rational decisions that you probably need to have to just be a pure investor. And again, I, I, I showed the video, you know, the story from you know, the Amazing Stories video where, you know, yeah, you, if you buy everything, like I, I, I use the Marshall Fogel, like, you know, example, like you just buy every vintage card possible of every hall of famer and the highest grade possible, you can't lose, but you know, to double, triple, quadruple your money, you know, he, he, you know, really made out from 2020 to now, uh, 2019 to now, because you know how much vintage went up, but you know, I can show you, you know, like, you know, this card here, uh, I just want to show you, you know, so let's blow it up. So, you know, back here in 2008 to like 2015 you know, for seven years, the card, you know, you know, went up, but you know, he didn't eight X, 10 X his money, you know, um, and you know, from 2008 to 2013 and 2014, the card virtually did nothing, stayed the same price. So five, six, seven, eight years, it did nothing. And that's the point is that you know, buying vintage as like a high growth or ability to invest in, and, and, you know, double, triple your money is just, it's a long-term game. You have to hold for a long time. And he did, and he it paid off for him, but you know, that is because he had the ability to hold. He didn't need the cards to, to turn into cash. And not a lot of people can do that. Not a lot of people can go out and spend, $10,000 a month on vintage cards and just put them in a vault and hold on to them for 20 years and then sell. It's a tough strategy to, 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 to implement because you, you kind of want to take some of those assets, flip them for other assets and play that game, which is fine. But you know, you always run the risk of doing something irrational like I, I've, I've done 
and take an asset and trade it for something else and that asset go way down while the asset you traded goes insanely high. Um, and, and that's the that's the risk you take. If you never do that, you just keep buying, buy everything, pay cash for everything. Um, you never run that risk and very few people can operate that way. So to me, you know, that kind of, you know, um, collecting or investing is just in, infeasible for 99% of the people in the world. Um, so the rest of us are kind of flipping and selling along the way and we run this risk. And then you add on to it the collector mentality and you're going to make a lot of mistakes. So, you know, I just don't want people to feel like they're the only ones that make mistakes. I make a lot of mistakes. I'm not the bastion of, you know, collecting um, ideals, you know, like, don't, you know, don't look at like how I put together my collection and say, wow, you, you, you did it the right way. I'm going to tell you, like, I made a lot of mistakes. I could have had a much better collection if I would have done things a lot differently. I could have had a lot of big cards that I don't have anymore. If I kept them and not traded them or sold them. Um, so that's just how it is. And you kind of have to forgive yourself and move on and uh, keep collecting because that's the fun part, you know, adding those, those pieces to your collection. And, you know, even when you make a mistake, just be like, Hey, you know, I made a mistake, you know, I shouldn't have done that and, and, and kind of move on because again, for some people, they can't handle that, the, the L the loss, uh, and it eats them up and then they quit collecting. And, um, you see that a lot. So yeah, that's the video. Um, just wanted to put that out there. Let me know in the comments what you guys think. Uh, like and subscribe. Uh, but yeah, I'm a terrible investor. Uh, but I feel like I, 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 I am a fun collector. So see you next time on Cards and Comics. Bye.